I think every kid's dream, you know, as a tennis player, when you come out to these local courts and pick up a racket like I did in, in Adelaide at a local club, you know, your dream is to, to be number one in the world for a day, you know, to win at least one Grand Slam. And, you know, for me it was to win Davis Cup at least once. And I was able to, to fortunate enough to win all, all those dreams, I guess, happened before, you know, when I was 21 years old. And, you know, it's a little bit, you've got to pinch yourself sometimes because you really can't, you know, understand that. And even though, you know, you have to change your goals, and it's, it's like an, an awesome feeling when you come out there and you, and you, you <laughs> it's an awesome feeling when you come out and you have that, um, know that you've succeeded and your dreams have come true and you know when I first won my first Grand Slam in the US Open it's just you know I didn't even know what was going through my head it really felt like so surreal out there um, the whole being a part of it walking out there next to a guy who will go down as possibly the greatest player ever in Pete Sampras and in my first Grand Slam I walked up to the net and uh, for the coin toss and I go up there and Pete Sampras is standing on the net you got the chair umpire there and then Ivan Lendl's tossing the coin for our match. And I'm sort of standing there for, I'm a little out of place here, <laughs> you know. And it was just a, a weird feeling. But, you know, even I remember before the semi final matches, there was, I had to play Kafelnikov in a semi final. And then after that, Sampras had to play Safin. And, and John Fitzgerald was speaking with um, Ivan Lendl actually before that semi final. And, and Fitzy came up to me afterwards and he goes, uh, I was just talking to Ivan, and he said, You're going to win this for sure. And uh, Fitzy, you know, tried to just tell me that, uh, I think, just to really let me know that one of the great players in Ivan Lendl, who was known for his work ethic and how hard he worked and how many Grand Slams he won, um, really believed that I was good enough. And, and yeah, and I had that, that in the back of my mind when I went out there to play Sampras, that I really could do it. And a lot of people thought I could do it, and my time had come. And, uh, you know, when I had that opportunity, I, I was fortunate enough that it was up two sets to love and a double break in the third set, so I didn't didn't really worry. But the feeling you get, you know, I don't mean to fall on my back when I win the match, but it's just it's relief in a lot of ways, and you know, just to to have that uh, incredible feeling of success. When you win a Grand Slam, you know, you, you sort of put yourself in a position. I went from you know, number seven in the world to number number three in the world, and then I put myself in a position to finish number one. Um, and at the end of the year, I knew that going into the Masters Cup in Sydney in 2001, it, it was uh, in my own control whether I got number one or not. If I won the Masters Cup at the end of that year, I got number one. And that's all I really wanted, knowing going into that. I knew it was, uh, I had total control of the situation if I was good enough. And uh, it turned out that I remember watching a match. I had to play Pat Rafter in the last round robin match um, to try and get through to the semi finals. I was already through to the semi finals. Um, and Curtin was my only guy because I'd beaten Agassi the day before, so Curtin was the only guy who could keep the number one off me. And uh, he was playing Kafelnikov, and uh, in his last round robin match, if Kafelnikov won, then I just had to beat Rafter that night, and uh, you know, one of my biggest dreams would have come true. And you know, I, I was nervous, and obviously I was barracking for Kafelnikov in the locker rooms. And I was sitting in there with my coach at the time, Darren Cale, and, and my close mate, Hayden Eckerman, and, and, you know, sort of just thinking, come on, Evgeny, you know, get through this one, just so I have an opportunity tonight. And uh, Evgeny got, came through in the end, 6-4 in the third, and then I had to go out there about two hours later and play against one of the guys who's been uh, so helpful throughout my whole career and a guy that I've looked up to and uh, owe a lot to. You know, he really, Pat Rafter really helped me out so much, not only with Davis Cup, but really took me on board week in and week out. I was fortunate enough to learn a lot from him by playing doubles with him. And uh, one thing that I'll always regret, that we never won the Davis Cup together um, in, in the last, in a final in the same year. But, uh, yeah, we've, we've had some great memories of, of playing Davis Cup together. So it was an awkward matchup to go and play against him knowing that you know, this could be one of my biggest matches of my life and uh, it was a strange situation out there and I ended up going out and uh, winning in a, in a tight two set match and uh, when I look back on it though and Pat and I will talk about it I'm sure in the years to come it was just it was probably one of the greatest things to have actually been out there with Pat Rafter at the time um, because you know he really broke the ice for Australia there. We had a bit of a drought of Grand Slam champions and he came out in 97, 98, won back-to-back -back US Opens and, and made two back-to-back -back Wimbledon finals. Um, so, you know, that, that was an awesome feeling, getting number one in the world. And 
you know, I came straight off the court and uh, into the locker room and I didn't know what to think and I get a message from uh, someone who's just sitting behind the desk at the, at the tournament site there and they come up and show me this written message that they'd taken someone had called and it was Greg Norman and uh, I'd never spoken to Greg Norman ever before and he was one guy that uh, I idolised growing up. He was one of uh, my sporting heroes growing up being a, such an Australian champion and for him to actually send a message straight after the match had finished was just an incredible and it really shows the person that he is. Um, yeah, he's such a nice guy, he's so generous and yeah, he's been there for me every time since. So um, yeah, I owe him a lot as well. And, and yeah, that was just a nice story, I think, at the time because you know I was just on the way up, and Greg was obviously at an age in his career where he was sort of just starting to finish his golf as well. So um, yeah, it was just a great time to be uh, playing tennis, and it, you know it couldn't have happened in, in you know a better place, being in Sydney in my home country. Yeah, right at the moment, Roger Federer is obviously the standout standout tennis player in the world. Um, He's such a complete player, as complete player as I've seen, and especially since I've been on the tour, I think. And uh, He's just good at everything. He's got a great all-court game. He uh, can play on all surfaces. He's got an unbelievable forehand. Um, but the big thing, for, I think, for, for juniors or people watching Federer play, um, who hope to one day be a professional tennis player, is the way that he moves into the ball. He has extraordinary balance moving in, especially on his forehand. So he can either put pressure on you by coming to the net after a big forehand or staying back and waiting for another short ball. Um, yeah, he's got such a great serve as well. He doesn't have an Andy Roddick serve out there with that much power, but he's got unbelievable placement. Um, and it's a big enough serve that he can serve volley if he wants to, um, or he can stay back and wait for that big forehand. This he got the better of me in 2004 in, the, in three out of the four majors, but. At the moment, it's no disgrace losing to Roger Federer because, uh, you know, as I said, he's been the standout player for the last year and a half. He's extremely confident at the moment, and that's something that you've really got to, um, you know, Roger Rashid, my coach, and I, you know, we've got to try and work out some kind of formula um, that, that's going to break down something in his game. And uh, if you can start getting him doubting himself, because he is such a, a classic player um, with so many great. Uh, great weapons out there on the court if he starts doubting that at any any time. You know, tennis is such a mental game as well. It's not all just about how you hit the ball. You know, everybody can hit the ball out there on the tour. You know, you go to a person ranked 250 in the world, they can they look like they can hit the ball as well as a top 10, top 20 player, but at the end of the day you need that something extra, that one thing that can, you know, turn a match and, and win you the big points in a big match in a big tournament. And uh, you know, the mental side of tennis is, is so important these days and uh, you know, I can't tell you how many matches I've won in the past purely because of just staying mentally tough out there, staying positive and that never say die attitude. Well I think I was fortunate I grew up just with a very, I'm very competitive in anything that I do as you see kicking the football or doing anything and uh, you know in tennis I, I believe in my ability, um, I, I believe I'm good enough every time I step on the court to, to beat anyone and I think just I've because that competitive spirit's in me so much that I can go out there and uh, compete and I, I refuse to give in. And I, I think, you know, the all-time classic was against Roger Federer, actually, in, in the semi-final of the Davis Cup uh, in 2003 in, in Melbourne Park. And I was down two sets to love, 7-5, 6-2, and he just broke me to go up 5-3 and serve for the match. And it was 30 all, and he was two points away from winning the match and taking the, uh, the semi-final tie to a fifth rubber. And, you know, I just kept hanging in there and hanging in there and, and I broke back and went to 5-4 and got on ser back on serving that third set and even though I was still another two and a half, three hours away from maybe winning one of the greatest matches of my life, I didn't think about that at all. All I was thinking about is taking this one game, try and get it into a tie break and anything can happen. If I get to two sets to one, yeah, it's such a mental game that even though he's had such a big lead, it feels like he should be in the locker room having a shower and that's when I tried to you know, really put a lot of pressure on him. and. Uh, yeah, he went out, uh, he took a toilet break after I won the third set in a tie break. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of little mental games going on out there that people don't realise. And, you know, I go, you know, when he's coming back from the toilet break, I heard he was getting a massage on his legs in there, so he's getting a little tired. So, you know, as he's running out back onto the court, I, I just went up there and, uh, you know, ran up and down in, in the start of where you walk back out in the court. And, you know, it, it's sportsmanship, but then again, you know, it, it's trying to get in your opponent's head as well and, and really you know, trying to use all, all the mental parts of, of what 
you know tennis is all about out there um, because you know over four hours a lot of there's a lot of momentum swings in a match and yeah for me that was just such a huge turning point anybody who's touched number one for a day a week whatever you know I know I held it for nearly two years and uh, 